Hi, Misha here. And I already put out a video unboxing one of the Eagle Moss 1 1100 scale die cast models, Warships of the World. These are Japanese releases. And I was kind of debating where to begin with doing videos on these. I really am looking forward to doing the Japanese ships, but I just don't have the time this weekend. So I thought, let's start a little smaller with the, the French fleet in the collection. And go from there. Plus, I already did a video on the Atlas 1 350 scale Surcouf Undersea Cruiser. So, this fits right in, I think. We have the Aircraft Carrier Baron. We have the Battleship, or as some would call it, Battle Cruiser Dunkirk. And finally, we have probably the most famous of the three. The battleship Richelieu. The uh, two older ships, the models are from 1939, and the Richelieu is circa 1945. If you're interested more in the features and packaging, and you haven't, you might check out the video I put out recently unboxing one of the examples. But yeah, I thought we would just kind of talk. 5-10 minutes on each of these, and maybe a little bit about the French Navy before and during World War II. Well, with that, let's get to it. Well, we'll begin with the aircraft carrier Bjorn. And actually, it matches the other two more than you might think, because this is a conversion. She started off life at least in part, as a Normandy-class battleship. The Normandies were ordered around 1910. There were going to be five of them, and the keel was laid down for Bjorn in January of 1914. So, you know, half a year before the Great War. Well, when the war did break out, construction was suspended. And really, not much, if anything, was done throughout the entirety of the war. And her sister ships were no better. Some of them were further along, but none of the five Normandy-class ships were completed. Bjorn here was actually one of the less further along ones, which is why she ended up being a conversion. The hull was only about 10%, and the engines not much better, at about 25% done. And the guns were somewhere in between the turrets and whatnot. France really had not done a, uh, a battleship in a long time. After the war in 1920, they needed the, uh, the slipway that this hulk, incomplete piece of steel, was taking up. So they quote-unquote launched her in April of 1920 and they really didn't have an idea what to do with it but then some of the French caught wind of activities in the UK and America and observed HMS Argus the aircraft carrier and had this great idea let's uh, use the, the hull and build a carrier of our own so, later on that summer and into the fall, they took the hull. They essentially slapped a board on top, as they called it, a temporary flight deck. And they kind of practiced uh, some mock carrier operations to see if it was, uh, was going to be feasible. And this showed two things. And by the way, this would become Project 171. It showed that, yes, you could take this Normandy hull and make it into a decent aircraft carrier. It also showed that decent was the best you could hope for, that really you needed a purpose-built carrier. So the idea was, okay, why don't we go ahead and build this up, kind of experiment and train with it, get our feet wet with carriers, and then we can, after learning some what do's and don'ts, build dedicated carriers in a few years. 
Uh, the proposal was taken to the government, and it was approved in 1922. And conversion and completion of the Bjorn began in 1923. She first started going through trials in 1926. The, uh, the, full, the conversion was basically done by 1927, then she went through fitting out. She was commissioned and joined the fleet in 1928. And she would serve alongside the later Dunkirks. At the beginning of World War II. And alongside the Richelieu at the end and after World War II. This would actually be France's only carrier that they would build before or during the Second World War. The, uh, they proposed dedicated carriers which were supposed to come into service sometime in the 1930s, the, the Joffrey class, never, uh, never materialized. So France had to make do with the sole converted Normandy Hulk. Well, what do we have? This was classified as an experimental training or test bed carrier. It is just a hair under 600 feet long. Had a crew of around 850 to 870. And it could hold up to 40 aircraft, although its initial flight group consisted of 32, 12 torpedo bombers, 12 reconnaissance planes, and 8 fighters. I feel like they reversed that order. I think I'd rather have 12 fighters and 8 recon planes, but that's just me. She was uh, capable of a blistering top speed of 21.5 knots, which basically means she was as fast as a submarine slower than the others. The flight deck was nearly the entire length of the ship. It was about 590 feet. And it had two hangars below that are they're just a little over 400 feet. She did have electrically driven elevators. The rear two were larger for things like the torpedo planes, and the front elevator was smaller, intended to be used for those of smaller fighters or what have you. Her guns were for defense. She had eight, six, and uh, six point one inch guns for surface defense, and she had six three inch guns for anti aircraft, and a mix of other smaller guns, one point five inch, and machine guns, and so on and so forth. So yeah, um, 32 to 40 planes is not exactly remarkable, even for the 1920s or 30s, but it did teach the French about operating an aircraft carrier. And, you know, they used a hulk that they had. Interestingly, the other Normandy ships that were partially completed were broken up, and material from those were used to help complete Bjorn here. Not much happened in the 1930s for her. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, war started off in September of 1939. And uh, some of her earliest missions were with the raider or raiding force alongside the uh, Dunkirk to try to destroy the uh, German warships, namely the Grosse Bay, but also, of course, Scarnhorst and Nazanau. It was not very successful at this, and uh, it was pretty much broken apart from the, the whole force. It just, it just didn't really go much anywhere, what, what's really to say about it. 
And then once Germany started invading France in 1940, she was loaded up with uh, part of the French treasury, gold bullion, and sent to Halifax, Canada. She made it safely and delivered her cargo into the trust of the Canadians. I guess that really says a lot about how much people trust Canadians. Just let them give them gold for safekeeping. And then her next thing was she was supposed to sail down to the to the USA and pick up some new fighter aircraft on order, including some Brewster Buffaloes. But this never came to pass before this could be, you know, completed. Uh, you know, uh, France surrendered and Vichy government, yada yada. So, at that point, the crew of Bjorn took her to Montenegro, and there she was in turn for several months. There, it wasn't really formalized, but since the crew did not seem to want to join the British or the Free French, the U.S. Navy, who was nominally neutral, kind of infer, enforced an internment there. The, uh, the aircraft were disembarked and taken ashore and pretty much all rotted away there through the elements and neglect and, and scavenging and what have you. Honestly, the crew didn't want to see to do much of anything. In 1942, after the U.S. joined the war on the side of the Allies, they did put pressure on the island's government to uh, go on and, and basically demil demilitarize the ship. But instead, a year later, control of the carrier was handed over to the Free French Navy. And then a plan was struck to sail her back up to America to undergo an upgrade and retrofit which uh, she left in 1944, went to America, and then she was out in early 1945. There she received a much more modern and, and comprehensive anti-aircraft battery. They also improved her ability to carry aircraft and be more effective as a kind of aircraft transport and cargo transporter. And again, not a lot happened. It's a pretty uneventful uh, ship. Right after World War II, in September and October of 1945, she would sail east alongside the Richelieu. And she would be part of the effort for France to reestablish, reaffirm control over Indochina, uh, Vietnam. So she would convey troops and aircraft and what have you. After that, she would return to France. And from that point on, she would pretty much be used as a training ship. And then later, she would be used as a floating barracks. I believe it was for people training to uh, operate submarines. But anyway, and this would be at the uh, French naval port of Toulon. And she would stay at the Toulon for a long time, about 20 years. But finally, in 1967, she was struck from the Naval Registry, decommissioned, and then officially condemned, meaning the she would be sold off to scrap, you know, they just sold off. And that was uh, pretty much it. If you didn't really hear much about battles in that little synopsis, that is because Bjorn has the distinction of never having launched her aircraft in anger, in warfare, in combat. But there and again, she was never meant to be some revolutionary new class or some newfangled thing, and she was done relatively on the cheap, too, so... Low expectations, therefore the low performance, the low uh, return is, is not exactly uh, mind-boggling. But a uh, interesting part of French naval history, and again, the only carrier they had until the, uh, until the 1950s or 60s, when they get into the modern, modern age. 
Well, with that, let's get on to something with a bit more firepower. All right, the Dunkirk class. There were two built, the Dunkirk herself and her sister ship, Strasbourg. These were the first battleships built, at least completed, in France since well before World War I. Even if that, they <laughs> sometimes they seem like they wouldn't get built. These are very much a treaty battleship, and by that it refers to the Washington Naval Conference in 1921, which led to the Washington Naval Treaty, which limited the individual tonnage of the signatory ships, as well as the overall tonnage of their fleets. And for most of the navies, it put a moratorium uh, suspension on new battleships. However, an exception was made for France and Italy because their existing fleets were woefully obsolete. And uh, France was allowed, I think it was like 170 thousand tons to build warships and a lot of designs were were looked at played around with between 1923 and 1926 so the earliest ones were going to be 17 and a half thousand tons which would mean they could build several then some got bumped all the way up to like 37 thousand tons which mean they could only build a couple and, uh, yeah, they pretty much were settling on a 25,000 ton design around 1925, 1926. And this was meant to go up against Italy's proposed cruiser fleet. And the cruisers were to have 8-inch guns, so originally... The new French battleship would have 12-inch guns, in armor capable of standing up to hits from 8-inch guns. This seemed acceptable, but then Italy kind of stopped and never really used their extra tonnage, which made France nervous. On top of that, then Germany started talking about rearming, which would eventually lead to the Deutschland class, and they had 11-inch guns. Long story short, the design they kind of finalized in 1932 would be 26 and a half thousand tons. Had improved armor, so it could take hits from the 11 inch German guns. And they would bump the guns from 12 inches up to 13. And France had been playing around with so-called quad turrets for some time, although really not ever using them in combat. So they went to the quad turret design, and taking a page from the British playbook, they put two turrets in the front and none in the back. This meant they could save a lot of weight because of not having to armor as much, having a shorter ship, a shorter uh, you know, superstructure and all that. It also helped with speed. Of course, they had secondary guns, which were uh, five inch guns, and they had anti aircraft guns, and so on and so forth. Now, this is a larger ship, as you can tell, to the uh, Bjorn. I didn't mention it, but this is about 22,000 to 28,000 tons, depending on how deep loaded it was. As I said, this is just a hair under 600 feet long. Well, the uh, the Dunkirk was a few feet over 700 feet long. And uh, again, nominally, it was 26,500 tons, although fully laden and everything, it would go well over 30,000. It had a crew of roughly 1,400. And a Respectable, if not amazing, top speed of 29 and a half knots. While its armor was nominally good enough to defeat the 
11 inch guns, he was still pretty lightly armored. It was it's officially classified as a fast battleship, although many sources call it more of a battle cruiser because of the lighter armor and lighter guns. Even for a so-called treaty ship, it's pretty svelte. Well, the Dunkirk was ordered in 1932. Laid down, construction began, and her sister ship, ship her sister ship was scheduled to be built beginning in 1934. So, Dunkirk's underway, and Strasbourg is just starting to, you know, get ready to go. And then the Italians finally come up and decide what they're going to do with their remaining tonnage. And that year they announced the, the Torrio class, a 35,000 ton warship with 15 inch guns. Unfortunately, the French were pretty well locked in, so the best they could do with the remaining ship that wasn't built was slightly bump up the armor, which added about a thousand tons. But the 13 inch guns were kind of locked in. There you have it. The Dunkirk started to be ready, was first uh, launched in 1936, began trials. In May of 37, it was sent as part of the French delegation to the coronation of uh, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. It, later that year, it would complete its uh, fitting out and be fully commissioned and entered into the fleet. 1938, it would be sent down the West African coast into some islands. And then in 1939, it would be integrated into some defense plans and whatnot with the British in the event of war, which by that point obviously was coming. This would be part of that Atlantic fleet, the, the, the I guess you, I'll call it the anti-raider force that was to go after Skarnhorst and Nezna, which was expected they would be sent into the Atlantic to work as commerce raiders. So these would work in conjunction with British ships. As far as her sister ship, she was a couple of years behind in construction. Uh, Dunkirk had almost two years to be it shaped out, which was good because a lot of the technology, including the turrets and guns, was brand new. So it's a bit of a trial and error. Even if the hardware worked, a lot of the crews needed to familiarize herself. And, you know, the shipyards weren't used to building warships because it was France. Construction was slowed for a few different reasons. Uh, for one... Yeah, it just, yeah, they had some worker troubles and whatnot, especially with uh, the second ship and the class, but anyway. She was barely ready by the time war began, and she began operations in September and October, but was relatively unsuccessful. And you can just kind of guess where it went from there. The Nazis invaded France. The Vichy government came. And Dunkirk ended up in Mers Kabir, where the British attacked. It was a whole thing in July of 1940. Essentially, and I could go into all the details, but it's late, I'm tired, and this is French stuff, so I don't want to make it an hour-long video. Let's just say between the summer of 1940 and the end of 1942, the poor Dunkirk was damaged time and time again, even basically being sunk and whatnot. It's a whole thing, it's a very interesting piece of history, because the British were attacking it. If it wouldn't, it's kind of like if you aren't with us, you're against us, but... They had legitimate fears that the Nazis would seize French naval assets. Very founded fears, frankly, because it's the Nazis. Even though they pinky promised they wouldn't do it, yeah, they're Nazis. I, I'm pretty sure in the dictionary of who not to trust, it's a picture of Hitler. So, yeah, it's a fear. So basically, the, they were given the options of either join the British or go to the Free French, 
be neutral, which involved they could go to the USA. And the French pretty much did nothing, and people died for needless reasons. It's hilarious in a dark, tragic sense. It's almost like something out of Russian history, frankly. Uh, after Operation Torch, when the Allies invaded North Africa, more and more French assets started to side with them, and this led to the Germans essentially taking over what was left of France. And that would include the battleships. And so orders were given from the Admiralty down to scuttle them if the uh, Germans tried to seize them. Which, gosh darn it, you know they did. And, uh, yeah. The scuttling was quite thorough. They were very well damaged and sunk, although in shallow water. The the hulks were there, and it was thought they could be potentially refloated and, and re refitted. But in 1942-1943, Germany didn't have any interest in it. But Italy did. Their navy was suffering. I don't know why. They didn't have enough fuel to even operate the ships they already had, like Roma. But anyway, so basically Germany just gave the, the junk to... Uh, to Italy. You know, we all have that friend who when we're trying to throw our trash out that wants to go through our trash and keep junk. And that's kind of what Italy was doing. So, okay, the, the hulks were handed over to Italy. They really couldn't fix them. They were that far gone. And just to put pay to this, in 1944, Dunkirk was uh, bombed during an Allied raid, further damaging it and completely just obliterating any chance. And, uh, it would basically just sit there as rusting metal until 1955 when uh, when it was eventually sold off officially as scrap. So not exactly the most illustrious career. Because he just came into service before the war. And uh, unfortunately, their most notable uses were against the Allies, not with the Allies. So, whereas Bjorn's history is a little anticlimactic, at least it wasn't actively used against the U.S. and, and Britain. Of course, to be fair, Dunkirk wasn't either, at least not effectively. That said, it's still an interesting design. I, I like the, the forward quad turrets. These had uh, two uh, float planes for reconnaissance on them, too. Kind of neat. It is a relatively big ship. But, really even before both ships were ready, their replacement was already on the drawing board in response to uh, German and Italian activity, the Richelieu class. So, trying to get through the Dunkirk so we can talk about a more interesting ship with a more interesting history, frankly, the Richelieu. Now this model here from Eagle Moss is from 1945 after she had undergone a pretty major refit and even reconstruction. But I happen to have a D'Agostini model patterned more off how she was when first introduced into the fleet in 1940. Now as I said and the video, these are 1,250 1, scale, so a little bit smaller than the 1,100. And it's more noticeable when you get to larger ships like this. On the small cruisers and destroyers, it's harder to tell. But, anyway. This was a direct response to the Littorio classes. In Italy, and also, of course, newer German battleships like the Skontors class and what would eventually become the Bismarck class. It is an upscaled Dunkirk. We still have the two super firing forward turrets with eight guns, but now 
they are 15 inches. They did consider 16 inches, but there wasn't really time, and the weight would have been even more excessive than the ship already ended up being. In the back, the secondary battery, we have three triple turrets with a total of nine six inch guns. So, where the Dunkirk had a secondary battery of five inch, this is six inch. And whereas the Dunkirk had two float reconnaissance planes, the ratio would have a total of four. So yeah, just everything's upscaled. Dun the Dunkirk was just over 700 feet long. This is about 813 feet long, so over 100 foot more. And she's much heavier. She is 37,000 tons, give or take, when light, and around 44,000 tons fully laden and heavy. If that sounds like it's France violating the terms of the Washington Treaty, you are correct. That's over the 35,000 ton limit on an individual ship, and it also put France over the entire allotment for their uh, for their navy and the French promptly told the British when they brought this up to go stuff it because in June of 1935 the British and Germans signed what's known as the Anglo-German Naval Agreement which long story short kind of shafted France and allowed Germany to get away with building what were supposed to be 35,000 ton battleships before they'd been limited to 10,000 because of the Treaty of Versailles. But, um, of course, you know, Hitler being as honest as he, were, he was, their quote-unquote 35,000 ton ships ended up being 50,000 tons. <laughs> yeah. So with all this, uh, yeah, the... Uh, <laughs> The, the class was first ordered in October and then laid down on the 22nd of that month. However, construction was initially quite slow in 1936 and 1937. Two ships would be planned and built. The British were nervous, so to try to appease their best ally, France did intentionally slow construction, but also there were those dockyard and shipyard strikes Workers wanted better conditions, better pay. Therefore, it really just wasn't ready to go in time for World War II. By September of 1939, the hull was complete, but the armament wasn't, the engines weren't, a lot of secondary things weren't. Nevertheless, in October, those systems that were at least partially complete began testing and even a captain was assigned on board. So pretty much as things were installed, they were testing them. In, uh, in the beginning of January, the engines were completed and then tested, and then towards the end of January, the last turret and guns were installed and then tested. She was officially commissioned into the French Navy on April 1st, 1940, April Fool's Day. And um, she would officially begin trials, acceptance trials, lasting from around April 14th, kind of culminating in a full-on test by June 13th, at which time she proved to actually be faster than her projected speed, capable of achieving 32 knots, give or take. A full crew would be between 1,550 and 1,600 officers and men. And she was officially declared fully operational on June 15th, just in time for France to go to the bargaining table with Germany, signing an armistice. Knowing this was coming, she was very quickly made ready to sail, still not 100% complete, and 
launched from France, sent down to uh, the West African coast. She would eventually end up at Dakar. The, the, the way that she left France that June was quite interesting. It was so quick, a number of the crew weren't able to make it on board. So she was kind of lightly crewed. On the other hand, I think 200 or 300 cadets from the French Naval Academy were put on board to try to get them out of harm's way. So she had cadets on board. I'm not sure if that was more of a benefit or not. A lot of systems that had not been installed, the, the parts were just, you know, winched on board when crates and they thought, okay, once we get out into safe waters, we can install them and work with them. What she was really short on were powder charges and shells for her guns. She had a few, but not many. And, much like the, uh, the, uh, the Beyond, she was loaded with a bit of the French treasury, a bit of a French bouillon, trying to get the gold out of harm's way. And she would uh, pop in to Casablanca for refueling and whatnot, and she would then make it down to Dakar and then get involved in a bunch of political hoo-ha. She got to, to Dakar around, uh, I think it was June 23rd. And her captain was kind of told, hey, there's a bunch of British around. Don't surrender to them. Keep the ship nominally under French control. Don't let Germans have it either. But at this point, the Germans are still playing nice. He was basically told if the British or Germans try to seize it, you can either scuttle it, or if you can, you can flee to a neutral country like, at this point, the USA. To which, promptly, he did neither. On the 25th, he left and tried to rejoin part of the French, the Vichy control, that I might add, French Navy. But, some thought that he was actually trying to defect to the Free French, so he was ordered back to Dakar. And so, after a very short voyage... Richelieu returned on the 28th. And then in July, the British launched Operation Catapult, which was basically, as I've discussed a little bit already, a way to get make sure the French ships either sided with them or at least at most were out of uh, German hands. There were some initial attacks, but the big one for her came on July 8th when uh, Swordfish from HMS Hermes attacked her. And one torpedo did get a good hit on, making a large hole. Actually, quite enough to, to kind of sink her, but again, shallow water, so no big deal to get her back up. And, uh, yeah, there was quite a bit of damage, and the problem is Dakar did not have a full shipyard, a full dock uh, place, so they were trying to work repairs with very minimal resources. Then in August, the British, along with the Free French, Charles de Gaulle, came up with a plan to try to capture assets, uh, French assets, in, uh, in Africa. And this led to the Battle of Dakar, in uh, September, which lasted from the 23rd of September to the 25th. It was pretty indecisive. Uh, a few hits were hit on uh, British ships, a few were on French. The things that came out of it, um, one shell from a British ship did hit the Richelieu and uh, did more damage. More importantly though, she lost several guns. Several of her guns exploded. Part of it was the fact that the 15-inch guns were rushed into service. Another part it was using rebuilt, remanufactured shells and powder charges, not actually meant for this gun, but they were making do with what they had, which led to, at one point, only one gun and a turret still operational. So she was further crippled. Things were pretty damn bad. In fact, her hull was not watertight throughout several weeks. 
the crew did their best. They were still trying to keep her up, finish up the installation of things. They even put a fresh coat of paint on. But it wasn't until February of 1941 that the hull was finally still uh, sealed up completely. You know, it was it was a patch job, pretty ugly one, but you know at least they could float her again on her. You know, yeah. And uh, yeah, it goes from there. Uh, according to the terms of the armistice with Germany, she should have been sent back to Toulon in France to be uh, neutralized, to be uh, dearmed. But Germany decided, no, we don't want her trying to sail back because the British are likely to capture or sink her. So stay down there. On the other hand, the Germans really stymied every attempt to get her fully functional again. They wouldn't let new guns, new shells be sent down. They wouldn't let new screws for her uh, propulsion be sent because they had been damaged by the torpedo hit. They really, they, yeah, it was just a, it was kind of an all-around mess. So she was uh, patched up, but in pretty, pretty rough shape in 1941. And then she did get some respite in 1942 for a while, and there was not a lot happening. But uh, then again, Operation Torch. And uh, at this point, the Admiral that oversaw the battleship here did side with the Free French. And uh, this would lead to an Allied commission to look at the French fleet in Dakar and to kind of evaluate what assets were there, what to do with them, and uh, can just basically where to proceed now that they were on their side. And of course, by 43, the war, while still not won, was a lot less desperate, at least for the British, than it had been. And that's when Richelieu would get a facelift. So the Allied Commission, representing the British, the Free French, and the United States, started evaluating the ships that had been captured, donated, or transferred over to the Free French at the end of 1942, trying to see which ones were good to go, which ones should just be written off, and which one should be sent to the USA for refit and repair. And uh, the Richelieu was uh, kind of a little bit of a bone of contention. America did not want to waste time and resources repairing it. It had several battleships already coming online by 1943. It just it didn't see a need. The Free French, of course, wanted to. This was a point of national pride. And to be honest, it is the largest warship France has, France has ever produced, even to this day in 2020. I get it. And the British actually were in favor of restoring it because they felt that they were outnumbered when it came to warships, especially in the Mediterranean. Now, to be fair, the Italians did have the Latorios, but really by 43 they weren't going anywhere because of the fuel. But, yeah, who knew in, in January 1943 what was going to happen later on. So the British thought that having the Richelieu on her side would balance things out nicely. In the end, the British and French prevailed upon the Americans and, you know, wanted to keep friendly relations. They agreed. So in January of 1943 she would take to the seas again to test her engines and to see how the repairs, the, the patched hull especially, were doing. It's kind of funny to think, but her engines hadn't really been used since she had returned to, to, to Dakar at the end of June of 1940. So, uh, yeah, the two and a half years of inactivity. She was decided to be seaworthy, although a bit barely. And they had to make allowances for the patch. In fact, the rudder had to be kind of canted 
at about a 70 degree angle to get her to even go on a straight line. But she did make it to New York on February 11, and she was put in the dry dock a week later. And I'll say this about the Americans, even though they didn't want to fix her, they made it a crash course priority. The refurbishment, repair, whatever, refit took five months, which is quite quick considering all the work done. But they had three different shifts working literally 24 hours, 7 days a week, around the clock. A lot had to be done, too. They had to permanently fix the hull. Of the eight main guns, three of them were just totally toast. The others could be fixed. Luckily, the three guns were actually uh, salvaged from her incomplete sister ship, so there's that. But the problem was ammunition. France was occupied, and the 15-inch guns were quite new. Basically, the car ended up sending uh, plans, drawings for the shells, and uh, they were made in America, copying them as best they could. They would also give her a modern anti-aircraft suite, including, including uh, the, uh, the Boffer's guns. But where America drew the line was giving the latest uh, radar sets and sensors. They they just they felt the technology was too new, too sensitive, too classified, and they were they they just nope. So she had to make do with what she had. By August and running through September, she was put to trials testing out her new systems, and then by October. She was released and would go back across the Atlantic. It was originally thought to send her back down to Africa, but in September the Italians surrendered and switched sides, so that threat was, was gone. She would end up going to work with the home fleet, British home fleet, and in November and December of 1944, Excuse me, 1943. Yep, anyway. <laughs> she would start practicing with the, the British ships, especially the King George classes. Not a lot happened for her. She had a quiet Christmas and New Year. But then in February of 1944, along with HMS Anson and the carrier Furious, she was sent kind of on a raiding mission off the coast of Norway to disrupt... British shipping. Now that wasn't the ultimate goal. They were hoping to draw out Tirpitz or someone else and uh, you know destroy some, some battleships or cruisers. As it happened, it was a pretty unsuccessful, unremarkable mission. Therefore, in March, she was detached from the home fleet. What to do with her now? It was considered using her to support and cover the, uh, the D-Day invasion. But she wasn't well suited for this, and uh, her sh guns only had armor-piercing shells, which are not really anything for bombarding. Instead, she was transferred to the Far East fleet to work with the British and American forces there. And she would transit using the Suez Canal, and... Uh, take part in her first operation, I believe it was Operation Cockpit, in uh, April of 1945. Originally in April, May, and into June, she was kind of used to distract the Japanese fleet, try to bait them out, but it was clear that they just, they just, they weren't able or willing. Rousseau, along with the British battleships and battle cruisers, started being used for shore bombardment. And uh, that's pretty much how she spent 1944, helping out. She would suffer some minor uh, wear and tear. And also they'd been having a chronic problem with, uh, with her boilers. Which only was getting worse and slowing her top speed by that summer. 
and so she needed to go in for a refit and repair and uh, this would ultimately end up with her at Casablanca now they did actually try to fix her in the Pacific using a mobile dry dock of the British but the Richelieu was just too big too heavy speaking of uh, after her retrofit she uh, she gained a little weight she was about 3,000 tons heavier also her crew jumped up to over 1,900 it was actually during this kind of second refit at the end of 1944 that she would get a more modern updated radar and then she would go on her second Pacific deployment in January of 1945 again supporting actions and covering landings and, and whatnot, you know, doing battleship things. Really, by this point, the Japanese fleet was a, was a memory. Even the surviving warships didn't really have enough fuel to go anywhere. And those that were still around were being harassed by uh, aircraft raids all the time. So she would serve through the end of the war. Uh, but just because the Japanese hadn't put up much of a fight, she thought it would be fun to uh, hit a magnetic mine in September of 1945, so technically after the war. It did nominal damage, pretty pretty minor, but it was a wound. Nevertheless, she would be used to help support French attempts to reoccupy Indochina, and eventually being relieved by ships like the Bjorn. Then she would transit back, going going home. She would briefly be used to convoy troops to North Africa, and then put back in the dry dock at Toulon. The first time she'd actually been in a French dry dock in a long time. So getting another refurbishment and found a, repairing that mine damage. She was uh, sent back out. And uh, in 1947 and 1948, where she was used as a flagship for a joint task force that had French, British, and German ships even in it. Keep in mind, 47 and 48, the Cold War is starting to heat up. And then at the end of 1948, again, she goes back for a refit with new equipment and just to repair wear and tear that happens at sea over a couple of years. And uh, actually, it's kind of deferred for a while. The, the French uh, naval budget is pretty low in the late 40s, so her next refit is suspended until the beginning of 1950 and was done at a pretty uh, leisurely pace, not ending until well into 1951. And at this time, it's decided, hey, the jet age, I mean, the Korean War is ongoing, but they see, the, you know, newer aircraft and, and newer ships. And basically, by 1952, she is turned into a seagoing gunnery training and school ship. A role that she fulfilled until 1956, when about the time she needed another refurbishment. But instead of doing that... She was basically stripped down, losing most of her guns, especially the smaller ones. She uh, Dehumidifiers were installed, and then she was more or less permanently moored and would be used as a, uh, a barracks and uh, stationary training ship for a long time. In fact, much like Bjorn, she would continue in this role until 1967, when, again, she was finally struck from the Naval Registry declared condemned and sold off to Italians for scrap. And I noticed, you know, the Italians always keep wanting the, the leftover uh, French hulls, no matter what. <laughs> but quite a long uh, long career. It certainly did more. It's, it's interesting that it was a French ship operating in the Pacific and operations continued after World War II. This is obviously a very condensed history. I'm I'm not an engineer. I'm not a naval historian. I just found it interesting, and I find these models interesting. But uh, it gives you some idea. It kind of maybe whets your appetite a bit. It's kind of always neat to see such things.
But yeah. And there you have my abridged kind of history of some French Navy ships from before and during World War II. As told with me and little diecast models. These are a lot of fun to me. They are um, large enough to have some interesting detail. For example, on the uh, carriers, they do have a texture to the hull to kind of simulate uh, simulate wood. Again, no moving turrets, but you really couldn't do that and have them durable this size. Yeah, the D'Agostini and the Atlas are a smaller scale and not quite as uh, quality as far as like alignment and stuff sometimes. But they're a little cheaper and they do quite a few that uh, Eagle Moss does not and vice versa. And again, the scales are close enough that yeah, unless you have them sitting side by side like this, it's not so bad. You can tell the Eagle Moss is kind of a half inch longer on each end, but it's what you get. But it's kind of nice to have the 1940 version and the 1945 version, so pre and post refit, because there were some changes. And, uh... These two are both circa 1939, so when they would have been operating side by side in the Atlantic trying to hunt German ships. It's about the closest Bjorn ever got to combat, potentially. But again, she was not really ever meant for that. She was just a teaching ship. And while the uh, Dunkirk was meant for combat, really by the time she was uh, hit in the oceans, the original ships she was meant to go up against from Italy were not much of a factor, and the Deutschland, while a thing, had been superseded by the Scarnhorst class and the Bismarck. So really, I mean, even though she's technically a fast battleship, I think, yeah, battle cruiser, or even, I think she's too big to be a heavy cruiser, but... Yeah, certainly a smaller, lighter battleship. And then the Richelieu is uh, decidedly a true, true battleship, quite uh, large and heavy, especially after her refit. At, at some point, she was over 45,000 tons, and again with the crew verging on 2,000 people, and uh, eight 15-inch guns plus nine six-inch guns is nothing to sneeze at. The French Navy itself is interesting. In a movie, they would have immediately joined up with the Free French, all of them. And a lot of uh, displaced Navy and Navy officers from other nations did. And, and some of the French did, obviously. You had Charles de Gaulle, you had the Free French, so I don't want to paint them all that, but... The Navy seemed remarkably indecisive. But that's really a story for another day. Probably more of these videos, I'll do short ones on individual ship classes, but I didn't really feel like breaking these up because uh, they kind of all flow together. So, for a long one for the French ones, but for the Japanese, unless I want to do an 11.8 hour video, I will definitely have to break those up by class. <laughs> so what do you think? Uh, like I said, I like the Eagle Moss models, but what do you think? And if you haven't, I did do an unboxing of one of these. It was actually a Russian pre-dreadnought, the board you know. But uh, they all kind of come packaged the same. I appreciate you tuning in. If you could, like, share, and subscribe, and all that good stuff. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.